Welcome to this YSL Lexel VBA tutorial. In this video, we're going to explain how to format bubble charts based on the size of the bubbles in the chart. We'll start with a quick bit of code that allows you to create a bubble chart using VBA in the simplest way possible, and talk a little bit about the arrangement of the data you require to create a bubble chart properly. We'll then explain how you can reference the bubble sizes property in the chart, and how you can calculate the min and the max size of the bubbles based on using some worksheet functions. We'll then explain how you can loop through an array of all the sizes, testing whether the size of each bubble is equal to the min or the max, and then how you apply formatting to each bubble in turn. So let's get started. To get started, let's create some basic sample data. For a bubble chart, we'll need three separate columns of values. The first one will represent the x value, so I'll create a column called x value. Then the second one will be the y value. And lastly, we'll need a value that represents the size of the bubble. I don't really care what values we actually use for these. So as we have in previous videos, we're going to employ the rand between function to generate a random number, in my case, between one and 20. When I've entered that formula into one cell, I can copy it across to the next two columns and then simply drag the formula downwards for as many rows as I like. I'll have 10 rows of data altogether. If I want to generate some new random numbers, I can press F9 to recalculate them. And when I'm happy with the values I have, I can copy and paste special values to fix those. So I can press Ctrl and C to copy. And then from the keyboard, I can press Alt followed by H followed by V and then V again. Or I could have just clicked with the mouse to choose paste values from the ribbon. When I've done that, I want to go into the Visual Basic Editor and then create a chart using this sample data. We can open up the Visual Basic Editor in the usual way, and then of course insert a module into the project, followed by creating a subroutine called Format Bubbles or something along those lines. Next, I can declare a variable which will hold a reference to the chart I'm about to create. I'll call it C as chart. Now there are several different ways to create a chart, but the technique that works best for creating a bubble chart with minimal effort is to use the add chart to method of the shapes collection of a worksheet. So we'll end up to begin with, with an embedded chart on the worksheet. To make this work, let's say set C equals, and then refer to the worksheet, which we would like to contain the chart. So we only have one available at this point, sheet one. And then we can refer to the shapes collection of that sheet. Now, sadly, at this point, we lose the IntelliSense, so we have to either guess or have written down somewhere, maybe referring to some notes, how to use the add chart to method. I'll spell add properly first. Add chart to. The advantage of using the add chart to method is that we can set the type of chart we're creating at the point we add it. So we can do that by assigning a value to the Excel chart type parameter of the add chart to method. And I want to make my chart equal to an Excel bubble chart type. So Excel bubble. I then want to return the reference to the chart part of the chart object we're about to create. So finally, I just need to reference the, uh, the chart property of that object. Next, we need to set the source data of the chart. And for a bubble chart, this works best if we reference only the cells containing the values, not the column headings. So there are several ways to do this. The easiest way by far is just to reference specifically cells A2 to C11 on this sheet. But if we weren't sure how many rows of data we were going to have, we might want to make this a little bit more dynamic and flexible. So let's say c.setSourceData and then we can set the source to be equal to worksheets sheet one dot range. And the first cell that I want to reference is cell A2. So that's the first cell containing a value. From there, I want to move from worksheets sheet one dot end, sorry, beg your pardon, dot range A2 dot end Excel down dot end Excel to right. There's a bit of a long winded way of referencing that block of cells, but it does guarantee that we will always be able to reference the entire table of values, regardless of how many rows you've got. So at this point, I'm just going to give this routine a quick test run and see what type of chart we end up with on the worksheet, making sure that it looks reasonably sensible. And there we go. That's what we've ended up with so far. Eventually, for readability purposes, we might prefer to put this chart on a separate sheet. And we can include code which does that. If I switch back to the Visual Basic Editor and then 
but this will probably be the last thing that we do in the entire procedure, we can say c.location and then we can set its location type to be equal to an Excel location as new sheet. So if I just return to Excel for the moment and delete this current example of the chart, and then head back to the Visual Basic editor and run the subroutine again, we should see when I return to Excel, this time the chart ends up in its own separate chart sheet. The next thing we're going to do is use a variable to capture a reference to the series in our chart. Now we don't technically need to do this, but creating a variable to hold a reference to the series makes it slightly easier to write the rest of the code. So returning back to the Visual Basic Editor, we can create a new variable. I'm going to call mine S as series. And I'll spell that properly. There we go. Having set the source data of our chart, what we can do is say set S equals C dot series collection. Now we simply need to reference the index number of the, of the series that we want within that collection. As we've only got one single data series, that's a fairly easy choice. It's series collection one. Now we have access to the methods and properties of the series object. Some of these we've used in previous videos in this series on charts. So for example, we've, we've referred to the values property, which returns an array of all of the values for the Y axis of the chart. So that will be all the, the values in the vertical axis. There's a similar property that would allow us to access the X values as well, interestingly called X values. And again, that returns a reference to an array of values. So it's a collection of all the individual numeric values for the X axis. There's also a property called bubble sizes. What would be wonderful would be if the bubble sizes property gave us a reference to an array of all the bubble sizes, but sadly it doesn't. All the bubble sizes property gives us, and I can demonstrate this reasonably quickly by using a simple debug.print statement, all the bubble sizes property gives us is a string representing the cell references containing the bubble sizes. So if I run this subroutine again, and then subsequently view the immediate window to see what's been printed out by the debug.print statement, there we go, we just get a string of text representing the cell references containing the sizes of the bubbles. What I'd ideally like to do is use this piece of information to return an array of all the values in those cells. And we can do this in a variety of ways, but here's the approach I'm going to take. First of all, I'm going to declare a variable which will allow us to hold an array. I'll call it bubble size array. And I'm not going to assign a type to it. I'm going to leave it as a variant. What I can then do is replace my debug.print statement by saying bubble size array equals and then I'm going to reference a range. The range that I want to reference is indicated by the address returned by the bubble sizes property. So if I simply say range, open some parentheses, s dot bubble sizes, close those parentheses, that will return a reference to that range of cells. When you assign a range of cells to an empty array, as I'm doing here, it automatically creates a two dimensional array and populates it with all the values in those cells. We can demonstrate how this works by viewing the locals window. So head to the view menu and choose locals window. You may need to rearrange your screen a little bit to make sure you've got room for both the immediate and the locals window at the same time. If I then use the F8 key to step through the procedure, you can see that the bubble size array begins as an empty variant. As I continue through the procedure, when I get to the section which assigns the range of cells to the bubble size array, you'll see that it's immediately populated with an array of values. You can see that it's a two dimensional array here. I've got dimension one containing elements numbered one to 10 and dimension two containing elements numbered one to one. To see the value stored in that array, I can expand it by clicking the plus symbol next to it. And then I can expand the other elements by clicking the plus symbols next to them. So we can hopefully see here that the first three, seven, five, four correspond to the first three values in column C in the worksheet, seven, five, four. The next thing I'd like to do is capture the highest and the lowest value in this, either the range of cells or the array that we've just captured. Let's return to the Visual Basic Editor and stop debugging. And then we can declare another couple of variables. Let's say dim max size as double, comma min size as double. We can then assign the min and max sizes to those uh, variables in a couple of different ways, but both will use the worksheet function object. I'm going to say max 
size equals worksheet function dot max. Now I can either refer to the array that I've already captured, bubble size array, or I can refer to the range of cells. It really doesn't matter too much performance wise here. I'm going to reference the range of cells using the bubble sizes address. So I can copy and paste range s dot bubble sizes. I can do the same thing to capture the minimum value. So I can say min size equals worksheet function, and this time use the min function. I can then paste in range s dot bubble sizes, close the extra set of parentheses, and then it's probably worthwhile just using the F8 key to step through and make sure that we capture the max and min size. So I can execute these two lines and we can see that the max size has been set to 17 and the min size to two. If we compare that with the values in the worksheet, you can see as we have a, a small number of cells here, the maximum size is 17 and the minimum is two. Now what we can do is loop through the values stored in our bubble size array, testing if the size of the bubble is the max or the min, and formatting the points corresponding to that size appropriately. Before we do that, let's just tidy up a little bit by deleting a couple of these charts, and maybe a couple of the chart sheets as well. Then we can return to the Visual Basic Editor, stop debugging, and let's create another variable which allows us to loop through the array. We need some kind of counter to loop through the array using a for next loop. So I'm going to say dim n as long. We can then use that variable to create a for next loop after we've captured the max and min sizes. I'm going to say for n equals. Now if we know the lowest number of lowest numbered element of the array that we're looping over. So for instance, I know that the array starts with a value of one, I can say for n equals one to the highest numbered element, which in this case would be 10. I have 10 values in the array. However, I can't always guarantee how big the array will be. So as we've seen in previous videos, we can use the L bound function to find the lowest numbered element in an array. If I say L bound bubble size array, if this was just a simple one dimensional array, that would be sufficient. When your array contains multiple dimensions, so our bubble size array essentially contains the number of rows and the number of columns, if you want to think of it that way. So we should say which element we're calculating the lowest bound of, or sorry, which dimension we're calculating the lowest bound element of, to put it correctly. So L bound bubble size array comma one, two U bound bubble size array comma one. A couple of blank lines and then we can say next n and that will now loop over all of the elements in the first dimension of our array. Now I can compare the value at that position in the array with the max size and min size values we captured earlier. So here I can write an if statement. I'll say if bubble size array and then the bubble size array contains two dimensions. The element in the first dimension I want to reference will be equal to n. And then as the second dimension only contains essentially a single element, that's always going to be one in this case. So if bubble size array n comma one equals max size, then before I fill in what I'm going to do to the actual point in the chart, let's just complete the if statement by adding an else if bubble size array n comma one equals min size then and I can complete that with an end if. If either of these two conditions are met, what I'd like to do is format the point that corresponds to the index number I'm looking at. One way to do that would be to refer to the points collection of the series. So I can say s dot points, open some parentheses and then refer to the number of the point I'm interested in. So that will be the same as the value of my counter, my n variable. From there, I could start to work out what formatting properties I can use. And if I know these quite well, it's not too difficult to guess or remember what the properties are. So I could say format.fill.forColor, spelt, uh, spelt the American way without the U, must remember that, .rgb equals RGB lime, for example. As you may remember from the previous video, if you watched that one, it's a bit tedious to have to remember the sequence of formatting properties. So a better approach or a more convenient approach when you're programming is to declare a variable which can hold a reference to a point object. Each time we go to a different element in the array, we can set that variable, set p, to be equal to s.points n. 
that makes it much easier to reference the correct formatting properties. So rather than having to refer to the points inside the if statement, I can simply say p dot format and I get the full IntelliSense list to help me to go down the sequence format dot fill dot four color dot RGB equals RGB lime. I'll do a similar thing for the uh, for the min size. In fact, I'll just quickly copy and paste that line. Pointless typing it in all again. And then I can replace the color this time with RGB red. Let's just close the immediate window and the locals window so we can see a little bit more of the code. So that's the entire thing, the entire procedure. Let's just give it one quick test. If I run the subroutine at this point, switch back into Excel, I should see that my bubble chart has been created. The point with the largest bubble has been colored in green and the point with the smallest bubble has been colored in red. There are of course lots of different ways you could choose to apply your formatting options. Maybe you're interested in a particular bubble size threshold. So if the size of the bubble, let's say, was above 10, we could format the bubble in green. Those are all relatively trivial things to do. It's just adjusting your if statement to suit. So we could, for example, say if bubble size, in fact, let's just modify our max size variable. We can comment this out. We could say max size equals 10 and then alter the if statement to say if anything was greater than max size, then color it in green. So this time, if I run the subroutine, I'll end up with another new chart. But this time, every bubble that has a size of larger than 10 is colored in green. So I think you get the idea from that point. You can play around with the if statements and come up, come up with the, uh, the exact formatting conditions you want. Hopefully that's given you some ideas for how you can play around with bubble charts in VBA. Thanks for watching. See you next time.